Hi, everyone. This is Lauren C., Deputy Editor of The Wrap. Welcome to Conversations on Cancel Culture. Today's conversation is titled, Coming Back from Being Canceled, Is There a Way? We're joined by top publicists, academics, crisis managers, and journalists to discuss whether or not someone can come back from being canceled. I'm honored to introduce to you our panel today. Joan Ball is an Associate Professor of Marketing at St. John's University and founder of the Womb Service Design Lab, a consultancy for small business owners and social entrepreneurs based in New York. Joan's research, teaching, and consulting work has a strong focus on service design, consumer behavior, and how to best create service systems and processes that result in social impact and human well-being. Gabrielle Gambrell is a marketing and communications consultant and NYU faculty graduate marketing and communications professor who has led triumphant media relations and strategic crises, news, and issues communications. She most recently served as the vice president and head of marketing and communications at Barnard College of Columbia University, becoming the first black woman to hold the title, as well as the youngest. Prior to Barnard, she was worldwide director of communications and public relations at FCB Global and was director of communications for NBC Universal. Matthew Hiltzik is president and CEO of Hiltzik Strategies, a strategic communications and consulting firm specializing in crisis management, strategic counsel, and corporate positioning. His clients have included Brad Pitt, Alec Baldwin, Justin Bieber, Drake, and more. However, much of Matthew's influence plays out behind the scenes. He's worked with Hillary Clinton and two of his PR protégés, Hope Hicks and Josh Raffel, went on to become key White House confidants to President Trump and his son-in-law, Jared Kushner. And finally, Dax Holt. During his 11 years at TMZ, Dax quickly became one of the most recognizable faces of the hit daily entertainment show. While with the organization, he earned two Emmy nominations for his work as a producer and became their top on-air correspondent. Dax is now the host of the Hollywood Raw podcast and has appeared on countless other programs such as Access Hollywood, The Talk, Dish Nation, and most notably, Live with Kelly. Thank you all for joining us today and participating in our conversations on council culture. Joan, I'd love to start with you. So we all kind of know what cancel culture is, and there's been public shaming of people that have been, you know, seen as having done transgressions throughout history. But in this social media era, there's really been a kind of swift amplification of judgment and punishment. And I was just hoping that you can kind of give us a, you know, overview of why things have come to this point in our society where people are just so quick to judge and quote unquote cancel people um, for even some minor transgressions and of course, major transgressions. Um, so what are, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, first, thanks everyone. Uh, I'm really happy to be here. Uh, and, and just quickly, because I know we're going to go into cases and we'll talk about a lot of specific uh, circumstances, but I'd like to zoom out for, for a moment and build on what you just said about the fact that there's some history here. Uh, but more than the history, I think that there is also a question of power here. And I think that to talk about cancel culture in this era um, and not talk about power and the difference between top-down power and bottom-up power would be to missing a, a really important part of, of what's happening right now. Uh, broadly, we are a culture in transition, right? This is a culture in flux. We had norms at one point, and you can decide they were you know, they were good norms, they were bad norms, they were helpful, they were unhelpful. But the notion of what was proper behavior in the culture was something that was agreed upon. And so if you had a certain behavior or you transgressed in a certain way, you didn't need the hive to come and say something about it because transgressions were accepted in many cases and the people who were being transgressed against didn't have the power to really do anything about it, right? You could you know, write a letter to a CEO, for instance, or you could write a letter to the editor in a newspaper, but the ability to really take that voice and move it broadly and have any kind of an impact was not something that really existed in the same way. So it happened on small scale. So you might be shunned in your community, in your town, in your city, at your job. But the idea for that to be then amplified beyond that just didn't exist. And so what we have is the perpetuation of, I, I believe that we've got some a few variables coming together, creating a perfect storm of what we have. First of all, culture in flux. So what is correct behavior is actually something we're wrestling with. We've got some people who feel correct behavior is this, others who believe it's that. And because we're really divided but also that power is shifting. 
the divisions, which may have always been there, the people who felt the wrong side of the division didn't have the power to actually have an influence. And now what we have is people who have the power to have an influence. They, rec they recognize my tweet, my hashtag can actually change the world. And this started as far back as the Arab Spring. But now what we're seeing is we're seeing the pendulum move to the fact to celebrity and so on and so forth, which I know is what we're talking about today. But that's what I, in my estimation, in my assessment, that's what we're seeing happen and play out. Yeah, that's a really good point, Jen. And there's also the scale. I mean, we, like you said before, you could, back in the day, you could just be one person complaining to one individual that you saw as a transgressor. Now it can be thousands, if not millions of people kind of echoing and amplifying that thought. And certainly we're not gonna go too much into the, the concept of bots and other kind of artificial enhancements, but the, the pressure is real. The cancellation is real. We've seen people lose jobs over this. We've seen people lose their livelihoods, their status, um, and it can be very damaging. Um, you know, whether you're a very experienced, you know, quote unquote, elitist, you know, privileged person, or someone who is just coming up in, you know, the profession. And in this case, we're going to be talking about entertainment professionals and journalists and media professionals. Um, so again, uh, thank if, you. If I can you. just, before yes. we move on, I think it's an important point to make that that's the double-edged sword. Right. So on the one hand, people who were having perhaps bad behavior, now they're being called to account for it. And there's a good side to that, right? Because that makes bad behavior not be as acceptable. But then on the other side, people can perhaps not have done something or it can be amplified in a way that it also has this negative effect. And so we're still wrestling with that. We're in the middle of the flux of the good news and the bad news about having what LeVar Burton calls consequence culture or cancel culture. And, and which is it? Is it consequence culture or is it cancel culture? Yeah, we'll be touching on that throughout this discussion today. I want to bring in Gabrielle and, and talk about some real life examples. So um, Nick Cannon is a really good example because he was essentially canceled last year for making what many consider anti-Semitic comments on his podcast. Viacom CBS, who he had worked with for a very long time, um, actually you know fired him. And initially, he actually didn't even apologize for his comments. But over the last year, he has sought counseling. And in fact, this week, he did an interview where he called it council culture rather than cancel culture. And, you know, he's, he said he's not asking for forgiveness. He's asking for understanding and empathy. Um, so in many respects, he's done the work. He's been rehired back into his jobs. And he said he's continuing to learn um, and uh, grow from that experience. So I just want to hear your thoughts on Nick in particular, because he's very present in the news right now and, uh, and a good example of what we're talking about. Yeah, excellent example. So I think something stood out in Nick's case. I think Nick in no way tried to be malicious. I think Nick was speaking from a genuine, a genuine place. I think those were his thoughts about the situation at hand. And um, Nick just graduated from Howard University, an illustrious HBCU. Um, I say that to say he's committed to education. He's committed to growth, despite his very successful industry um, career in the industry. With that being said, after Nick was canceled, quote unquote, when he lost his show, he then was very vocal about, okay, I'm going to be open. I'm going to speak to rabbis. I'm going to speak to my Jewish brothers and sisters. And I wanna hear what I did wrong. I wanna hear what I don't understand. And for Viacom swiftly made a comment and announced that while and out, a very successful show that he's starred in as well as being executive producer would no longer be on air. Other opportunities he had seemed like they were going away as well. Once he did the work, Viacom as well as Nick both made statements about, okay, we'll come back. So I think it's really interesting to point out that it was not malicious. I don't think anyone thinks that his initial comments were malicious, perhaps ignorant, but not malicious. And to Joan's part, uh, Joan mentioned kind of people's interpretation. I do think that people genuinely are empathetic and people understand when you make mistakes. So there's a difference between making a mistake and being intentional or having malicious intent. And I, 
I think the sky's the limit for Nick Cannon. I feel like I see him on the gossip blogs. I see him in the trades. I'm always seeing great things when it's happening to him. And that will not be necessarily a fine point in his career. It'll just be a story. Yeah, you know, it was definitely a, a defining point, I would say. Maybe not the only defining point in his career, um, but he's even, he's even said it's been a pivotal moment for him. And what I liked about Nick, and we'll discuss about this a little bit later, but how do you know when is when enough work has been done is that he has said he's still doing the work and he has still a lot to learn and he's still in communications with these Jewish leaders, with these rabbis. And that is always kind of a positive sign. Um, you know, you also have a experience working in network. Were there other examples that you can think of where a high profile person was kind of subject to this scrutiny um, and how they dealt with it? Yeah, um, during my time at CBS Corporation, uh, before the merger of Viacom CBS, um, I was working with the CBS Entertainment team. I was on the communications team. And Charlie Sheen was one of the highest paid actors on network television. And we saw the world saw these YouTube videos emerging. Um, and he it was the whole winning was trending and people were trying to understand what is happening with Charlie Sheen? Um, and CBS, along with Warner Brothers, made a decision to replace him on the show. That was huge. It was pivotal. Charlie Sheen was so beloved. He's still a phenomenal actor, so talented. Um, and his catalog is incredible to this day. But that was a huge opportunity for some people to say, hey, what's going on? Other people to inquire, hey, is there a mental health issue going on? Um, is there something personal going on? And then other people were perhaps on the cancel train, like he perhaps does not deserve to have this illustrious position, his high paid profile position on the show. And so we know in that instance, um, Charlie Sheen was replaced on the show. And then years later, I think about four or five years later, he announced that he had some personal things going on. We later found out he was diagnosed with HIV. And I think a lot of people were perhaps like, oh, wow, you know, we don't know the timing per se of, but I appreciate him when he did that exclusive on, MB, on NBC, he spoke to the Today Show and gave them that exclusive to say, hey, here's what I've been going through, here's what I've been dealing with, and I own my truth. And I do think that was phenomenal for him and very courageous of him to do that interview on the Today Show and own his truth. Yeah, you know, you mentioned his videos and this preceded kind of the social media era that we know right now. Um, it was, you know, definitely, you know, a couple of years before kind of Twitter and Instagram took off. But Charlie's a really good example because he was basically the highest profile actor on television. And we always look at things with presentism and, um, you know, perhaps, Joan, you want to weigh in a little bit here. You know, the immediacy of social media, even compared to those Charlie Sheen television days, People are, again, so quick to judge and look at it with a very present lens. And for Charlie to kind of come around again years later to talk about his HIV diagnosis, to talk about, you know, some of his issues that he had with, you know, fidelity and, and his, his sex addiction, um, you know, that is probably something that took a while for him and his team to craft. And we'll, we'll also pivot to Matt, Matthew in a second about this. But Joan, can you weigh in on just, again, the, the immediacy of social media and how, how swift it is, sometimes not even within 24 hours, to kind of jump on, jump on people and not even let them explain in, in, in a follow-up tweet even? This immediacy, again, it intersects with what is acceptable. Right. So if you think about it, if you if we had the exact same environment right now, 20 years ago, and you found out that a presidential candidate had smoked weed, for instance, right, that would have been a cancel. And we went from I've never smoked. I smoked and I didn't inhale to of course I smoked I was in college right and within right within the space of kind of three presidential candidates the culture shifted enough that something that would have been a cancel 20 years ago is not or you so, could just say that honesty and candor was better well, people also well uh, well it could be that or it could be that even if someone was honest at that time they wouldn't have been elected Right. And I think that there are both things. I think if someone was honest and had candor in 1950 and said that they smoked weed, they would not get to the starting gate. 
right? right? So part of it is honesty and part of it is what will the culture accept? And I think that as we move through, what we're having is really different ways of thinking about the world that are then amplified very quickly. So people are not given a moment to say, is this acceptable to us or not? It's immediate and we're being reactive and we can be reactive because we read it and then tweet it, <laughs> right? Read it, share, tweet, because it, it and, and it's in that excitement that we're doing it, there isn't a lot of discernment happening or even sense-making happening. And that I think is going to be with us for a while since this amplification is so immediate. That's a really good point, Joan. Thank you. And I want to shift over to Matthew because we I'd love to hear from a manager side or a you know a celebrity side. How do you respond to this? Sometimes these things take off so quickly, so aggressively. And you know, you're in the business of you know crafting statements and putting out press releases, and that is basically kind of thrown out the door. The model is when you know things can either be taken out of context very quickly. Um, something from the past is dug up and kind of explodes on, on the internet. Um, how do you react as someone in your position, Matthew, and, and you know, your clients to these kind of very almost near instantaneous you know, blow ups as it were? I think a big thing about it is really maintaining a perspective about the medium to long-term interests of the individual. And what, yes, things you decide to do in the short term can have an impact on the long term perspective, but it's really important to remember that you, shan't, you don't want to just win the moment. You want to make sure that you're being responsible over a longer term period. So in general, I, I prefer to take a more uh, deliberate approach because I think one thing is that in the heat of the moment, the passion is there, the intensity of the responses on social and digital are, are way stronger than they are if you let it dissipate a little bit. And, and very often if you understand sort of what cards you have to play. If you play them too quickly, they're not gonna necessarily be that effective because a lot of time no one wants to hear it. And I think one thing that came up in both Gabrielle and Jones um, in, in their answers are that it really depends on the situation. If it's something where someone is rightfully accused of something. So if you look at a Nick Cannon thing, Nick Cannon said something, but also I know some of those Jewish leaders Nick Cannon has spoken with, the sincerity and everything else is there. But the reality is Nick Cannon also had a relationship with his audience he's engaged with them over time. People have a pretty good feel for who Nick Cannon is. And so there's a distinction between the broader audiences and the corporate side. Corporate sides are very fearful very often of having anything that will upset sponsors, that will change dynamics in terms of uh, personalities on shows. Like there's a real uh, fear and, and uh, of any confrontation or controversy that's made, made worse. Some companies are actually great in that they stand by their talent more and they do pause and they give it some time. Um, but I think the challenge is how do, you, uh, how do you address it? There's the separate piece, which is if there's not a recording or there's not something that someone didn't public, which is, did it happen at all? And where you get into a he said, he said, or she said, she said, or any, of the, any version of that, um, or they said, or whatever it may be. And so the, the point is that that's a much more challenging situation because there has been a general, um, and we've seen it with some of the major talk show personalities and others who have made statements to the effect of, oh, well, if someone says something, then we have to believe them. And I think we should, it's very important, we should be encouraging people to speak up. We have to create environments where we're talking about power and, and dynamics. We have to make it that anyone has the ability to speak up and to share their truth or their perspective. But at the same time, there also has to be an opportunity to be able to evaluate the realities of whether that's actually accurate of what happened. And I think that the, the challenge that we have over time is that we have very clashing dynamics at play because there could be things that were brought up between Gabrielle and, and what Joan said, where, look, we're in a week where Naomi Osaka have talked about mental health issues. And so these are things that are very often, the mental health perspective can be something that influenced someone who spoke up and may not have actually told the story accurately be, or were trying to make up for something in their past because they did have challenges. They, were, they may have had addiction issues. They may have had mental health issues. And so when they accuse someone, they may have gone further than they maybe what was actually accurate because of that. On the other side, you may have someone who made a statement or acted inappropriately and very wrongly, but because they themselves were not in a good state of mind. 
and had not sought help for, and Charlie Sheen certainly is an example of, of that. And so I think that the, the thing that we need to be careful of is not to jump to conclusions and not to um, assume things just because the Twitterverse is, is trying to have you do that. And, you know, we've seen people who were wrongly accused, there were investigations um, and people who were able to come back, but maybe 30 or 40% of, of where they were before or 70 or 80% because some people aren't gonna ever get over um, what they were accused of, even if it was determined to not be accurate later. Right, I love I, how you brought that. Can I piggyback on that? Yes, I'm please, sorry, go ahead. Lawrence, I apologize. Matthew, when you mentioned Naomi, I'm like, yes. I think that is so timely and such a good example because some people are literally saying, hey, Naomi, you literally get paid to do mm -hmm. media. It's a part of your contract. Um, Afterwards, you have to talk to the press. It's literally a part of the show. So for her to come out and make not one, but two very elaborate, what I interpret to be authentic statements about her battle with mental health and anxiety, um, I do believe that those who are like, mm, you are wrong, you're in contract, you have to do what you have to do. Everyone did it, Serena did it, Venus did it. I do think that will change the mode. I anticipate within the next six, months to a year that there will be some leniency or there will be special accommodations for individual that individuals that battle mental illness and have issues when it comes to dealing with media and press so i think that's such a great example of when perhaps cancel culture can create good things i i agree with you both both with what um what you both said and i think that there always has to be context and I, I think we can all agree that anytime we hear uh, he said, she said, or variations thereof situations, we need to hear truthfully and authentically from both sides. The issue is that social media is so immediate and they almost demand from, you know, the parties involved an answer. And again, you know, people like Matthew and Gabrielle who work in communications and have that experience, you know how important it is to get, get all the facts right before you put something out. And I think the danger is now we live in this time where almost talent can be goaded into responding if they if you know people feel that the answer isn't good enough or you know appropriate. But I think I think you're, you're one thing you're really touching on though is who is making that decision that something is right. not good enough. Absolutely. And I think that there is a huge disconnect between the Twitter mob and regular people, and I think that's something that we've seen is that people very often, and unfortunately, there are too many otherwise good journalists who are playing to that crowd. And they're looking for that uh, positive reinforcement from being able to report a certain angle or a story. So I, and there's several, you know, in general, I'm a huge proponent of cooperation with journalists. I think that journalists play such an important role in things. When you are looking at promotion, there is a balance that has to be achieved, whether it be athletes or celebrities, because without having the media as a, uh, as a, a platform, it's, it's not gonna be the same in terms of promoting things. Yeah, social and digital have changed that, so there's less of a need. That's why you don't have the big get interviews as much anymore, because people speak to the audience. But that being said, it, it's just something where there has to be a responsibility. There are certain journalists who decided, like they know the outcome of what they want from a story. So they'll sanitize it of facts that don't exactly work. Even you'll have activists in certain cases with domestic violence or other areas who don't take the time to understand a specific situation and just sort of shoehorn one situation into a uh, to match the narrative they want. And I think people need to be a little more careful because the imperfections of who we are all as human beings is that if you, it goes back to that truth telling thing, if you're just honest and straightforward, you're gonna come across a lot better of like, yeah, I smoked versus I didn't inhale, which sounds ridiculous. Um, person won anyway, even though he did that, because there were a lot of other issues at play. And I think as you I have a political background, and I think that's something also where people are not as focused on some of the surface things, they really just want to know who's going to help them. And I think that's another form of celebrity where, you know, you have to understand that that reality too is, you know, what actually is best for me? And can this person, what can this person do for me? Right. Look, Dax out, we got to get him. No, I, I was, I was, I was just, just going to say, say, this is a perfect opportunity to bring in Dax, because Dax, you were a journalist 
entertainment journals kind of before the social media era where celebrities were taking in their own messaging and putting out, you know, their own stuff via Insta and Twitter. But you now have a podcast that you actually invite celebrities to come on and talk because that format is now kind of missing that opportunity for a celebrity to sit down with a journalist. And that's what you are doing on Hollywood Raw. Talk to us about that dynamic and why so you're finding so many talents are coming to that to you and wanting to do this longer form format rather than just tweeting and Instagramming and all that? Well, I think that you can get your full message out. You know, we've talked a little bit about context and a lot of times that context is not there if it's just a, you know, 120 character tweet or, hey, I'm gonna put out a message through a publicist and then People Magazine's gonna type it in there. You want to hear from the celeb. You want to hear if there is a genuine apology or, a learning moment that they can speak to of how they've grown since whatever their situation was. And I, and I think that's kind of what we have gone at, you know, at Hollywood Raw is like, come, come on our podcast and let's talk about it. Let's talk about it in a non-judgmental situation where yes, people make mistakes. And I think Gabrielle put it really well with, it was like, was this a malicious mistake? Or was this an ignorant mistake? And I think there's a huge difference there between someone who throws out a, a racial slur, you know, just off the top of their tongue, or if they say something because they don't know the backstory and they think that what they're saying is correct and you need to give them that moment of education. So we like to invite people on and say, okay, let's talk. Let's talk about why you said what you did or why you did what you did. And now let's explain how your life has changed, what you've learned from it. If you are actually listening to what people are saying and why people were offended by what you did. And I think, a, a, you know, someone that we had on recently with, was Kristen Doty from Vanderpump Rules. It was a, a great situation in regards to she just got fired from Vanderpump Rules for, you know, some tweets that she had made against one of her co-stars that was uh, a woman of color. And, and Twitter did come after her and Bravo eventually got rid of her. And we said, okay, come on the podcast and let's talk about it. Let's talk about the conversations that you've been having, what you've actually learned and have you learned anything? And it was a really great conversation to the point where I noticed a shift in, in the dynamics. So once we released it and people started listening to it, hearing the full interview, people were going, okay, I, I hear that she has learned. And whether some of her answers may have been, uh, you know, well thought out, either way, they could hear the genuine, like, feelings behind it. And I think that goes a long way. You know, it's, even if you go on GMA and you say, hey, I'm so sorry, guys, I, I, I messed up. It's also, that's four minutes. If I can give you an hour of my time and I can let you really dive deep into the situation, I think that helps out big time with a lot of the, the, these, these people, you know, uh, I, I think when we, we bring, bring up like Charlie Sheen, uh, one of the things that I, I, I feel that he almost doesn't fit in this category because he kind of canceled himself. You know, he, this was a self-destruction sabotage kind of situation where he obviously had a lot of other things going on in his life. But that was, I think, a moment where most people were sitting back and cringing at like, what are you doing? Why are you telling your bosses not to have you back? Why are you showing up late to set? Because as a boss, I'd be like, well, I wouldn't want him here either. So, you know, and I think people were fascinated by the crazy of it, but I don't think people canceled him. I think he canceled himself, literally. Um, and then Matthew, the one thing that you, you were saying it with in regards to media, I think there is a big hand that media plays in this because the media likes to almost push it more. You know, they like to talk about cancel culture and they like to, oh, so Sears is dropping them as a, as a client. Well, that's a news story. Yeah. But you know, it, it, I think it plays hand in hand. You've got the Twitter mob and like social media mob. And then, like you said, you've got media who's propelling it all along. So it's yeah, like, and to that, these, that point, Dax, like sometimes media will actually call uh, an actor's agency or they'll call a network to say, oh, are you dropping them? Are you dropping mm -hmm. them? And they'll try to be, find a way exactly, it's so on point, about trying to advance the story through something like that. And so- But it's yeah, making it worse. Yeah, it's totally making it worse. I mean, I think that there's the, the gap between what the general public cares about. There are so many factors that go into these things. There are some times that, um, you know, people of faith, 
have a perspective about forgiveness and the idea about giving people an opportunity um, to learn about it. There's things about how old someone is. There's things about where someone is in their career. It's something where if someone does something when they make a, a bad video when they're 14 years old, you know, are you going to hold them accountable and try to just cancel them entirely? You know, you see situations like that. What are the standards you're going to hold someone to? Because in someone's own culture, if they're from another country, there are different standards that that apply. And I think that it's really important to look at the individual and to also understand, like in general, um, you know, we want people to educate themselves before they really start talking. Because people could play a big game about like, oh, I'm going to go do this and I'm going to go do that. But why don't you do it first? before he did. We had a client who had, uh, in, in, in sports who had used uh, the inappropriate um, word that's offensive to the LGBTQ community, the F word. And so it was something where we went to Glisten and they spent time with, um, you know, teenagers and who explained like, why is this hurtful? What is their experiences? And it was pretty like a real tough conversation. But on the other end of it, that person who was a coach was able to to go speak to other basketball coaches and say, hey, I heard directly from kids. I learned from it. And they were doing it. There's distinctions between, you know, to Dax's point about how, you know, Charlie's gene cancer himself. Well, there's other examples on the positive side where someone said, hey, this hasn't been public yet, but I want to get myself help on it because I haven't, I, I need to learn. And they go get help, but then someone finds out later that it happened. Well, do you give them a, like a mild pass because they had gotten help on their own? Or are you treating it the same way of someone who just got caught? And I think all these variables really play into, um, you know, how to consider things. And, and I think to Joan's original point about power dynamics, it's something where that has shifted as well as we're shifting culturally. And so I think the power can go to someone who has that influence to be able to impact what happens on social and digital and to be able to do it differently. And I think we just need to find that right, you know, equilibrium in the middle. Yeah, I love this notion of grace and giving people grace and space. And I was wondering if anybody wanted to talk about that because again, Twitter is very unforgiving. Um, it is the, the nature of either anonymity or just kind of democratized feedback is that people can go in and they can go in very hard without necessarily knowing the context around it. And I think as, as Matthew said, you know, I think the media and Dax said, the media does amplify this because you want to put out a saucy headline that says X person canceled for X behavior. And it's very easy to kind of just latch on that and run with it. Uh, Gabrielle, do you have any kind of thoughts? I do, on I do. To Joan, Joan started this conversation earlier by talking about the difference of generational, generational cultural differences. And I think today, um, I think black Twitter is vicious. So even talking about Naomi recently, um, there was, it was trending on, on Twitter, black Twitter. Hey, we got to show our support for her. We can't let them cancel her to that point. As a professor, I teach graduate school at NYU. My students are that gen Z. There is an expectation for them. They want to, they care what you, they care what you did last night. They care what you're doing tomorrow, but they care about your values. And so this new cultural, um, expectation that we want to know you're a good person. We want to know that you have good intent. I think that speaks volumes and it makes those advertisers, it makes those large corporations say, oh, do I need to pull my dollars? Do I no longer need to be a partnership with this person? Should I, um, if we bring up recently Teen Vogue, they, uh, a few months ago, they, Teen Vogue announced a new editor in chief of that coveted position, editor in chief of Team Vogue. We now know they rehired a person because social media said, nope, she shouldn't have that job. She should not deserve that job for something she did when she was a teenager. So I do think Team Vogue, this young culture, Gen Z, it shapes how, as a society, we are living in our expectations, yeah. our expectations. I mean, we had, we had someone, if you just look, even in the past few weeks, um, you know, there's examples of a lot of anti-Semitic things that, that have come up in other situations. And um, there's a woman, Eve Barlow, who's a, who was a journalist on uh, music, and she's someone who's uh, Scottish and, and Jewish, and she lives in, out in LA, but she's somebody who has spoken up and very proudly about being Jewish. And she has been on the receiving end of an insane amount of hate online, simply for not saying anything negative about anybody else, but for just speaking up and being proud of her, of her background. And so to me, that's the other side of this, is that sometimes the, the person who ends up being in the spotlight 
is not actually the person who should be, no one should be canceled. I just don't believe in that idea. But that person is the one who is actually, uh, in a way, a victim of sort of a, a group of people who are attacking in a way that's not appropriate. I mean, the, the education piece is so important because a lot of people who go through this situation on their own are then able to educate, who actually did something wrong, are able to educate others. There's a Myers Leonard is a basketball player on the, um, who's on the, who was on the heat and he was playing, um, uh, he was playing Call of Duty and he was streaming on Twitch and he used the term, a, a word begins with K about, uh, to describe Jews, that's very derogatory. And it took like sort of a day for people to realize that he had said it. Um, he's somebody who I, I had known him before from doing some work with him. Um, he does not have a racist or any Semitic bone in his body. He just doesn't. He just had heard this word online and didn't know anything about it and just used it the way other people had very indiscriminately. Um, and over a period of you know four to six weeks, he was spending time totally in the background. He met with all sorts of people in the Jewish community, Holocaust survivors, Jews of all different backgrounds, women rabbis, male rabbis. But the point of our conversation was to take that to where he can then use that for the purposes, and he didn't do any interviews, he still hasn't, um, maybe Dax, we'll talk about that at some point, but, the, um, but to be able to, to take it to a place of fighting hate on, of all kinds on video games. So he wants to take his experience, and we're working on ideas with different groups to be able to do that. And to me, someone who's been through it themselves and recognizes it and was self-aware and wanted to learn is one of the most effective, um, he or she can be one of the most effective speakers under those circumstances. And I think that's where we have to be careful about uh, encouraging, embracing someone and saying to somebody, hey, if you do educate yourself to whatever extreme extent that is, there is going to be a place for you because we know that you're going to be in a place where others may listen to you and learn from you. And I think that's the part that gets very short shrift and, and needs to be considered a lot more because I think regular normal human beings are much, and Americans and even people globally are very forgiving if they see someone recognize it. You can't get into like false apologies and all that. That's a whole separate conversation. But I think if there is that sincerity and substance, then there is an opportunity for people to celebrate those type of folks as like, hey, here's a good example about how to deal with it properly. Yeah, that's so the crisis that, we're talking about. Go ahead. Dax. On that note, with education, watching that unfold, I think that Bravo missed a really good opportunity with this. Instead of listening to the Twitter mob and immediately firing Kristen from Vanderpump Rules, I think if you would have watched her journey and learn and be educated and and realize what she did wrong on Vanderpump Rules and have them actually play that on Bravo. I think that education would have gone a lot further than just get rid of her. Uh, we don't have to talk about it, let's just get rid of her. So I think that there's times in our society where these big companies that just get rid of stars or get rid of celebrities, if they took their power and their platform and they educated the mass, I think that would go a lot further. I'm not, I, I think I'm kind of in agreement with a lot of you people. Like I, I don't, I don't think canceling is necessarily the right thing to do. I think that, like we said before, this is consequence culture because you are having to have a consequence, whether that means you should never work again or whether you should never walk down the street without someone booing you. I mean, that's something, but like you see these people who have worked their entire lives to get somewhere. And I think Billy Bush is a good example of this, works your entire life and one moment on an Access Hollywood tape defined everything for him and well and the other, guy on, a consequence. the other guy on the tape became president i mean let's let's also like exactly look. <laughs> but i think i think you know yes he deserved a consequence because you are being compliant in a situation and if you're giggling at you know a, a crude joke but do you deserve to lose everything you've ever worked for i don't agree with that but there should have been education and if they put that on television and watched him learn, I think a lot of people could also gain from that knowledge. Yeah, I, I, you bring up really good points. And I want to pivot a little bit back to what Gabrielle was saying about Gen Z, because the social media space is a younger space. We're seeing that's where the highest engagement is. And I want to talk about young people getting canceled. You know, she mentioned um, the Teen Vogue editor uh, who is, you know, in her 20s, but there are also people that are being canceled in their teens. And I want to talk about the effect of, of that, because I think it's a very 
dangerous thing. For example, um, there's the D'Amelio sisters, Charlie and Dixie, very well known, hundreds of millions of followers. And, you know, last year um, it was Charlie who was quote unquote canceled because of this video where she was saying, complain, basically she was saying, I only have 95 million um, followers. I want to have 100 million followers. And her fans and, and Twitterverse just thought it was the ultimate expression of privilege and kind of arrogance. And she put out a very emotional video afterwards. She's 17 years old and she was clearly experiencing emotional trauma from it. Her sister in that kind of same video had made some offhanded remarks to the chef that was kind of catering this dinner. She also kind of got canceled, you know, put out some emotional responses. Is it is it very dangerous? I mean, clearly it is. These are people who honestly don't necessarily know better. You know, when they're making these comments, they're putting out all all this type of content all the time, maybe without thinking of the consequences, whether it's ignorance or just frankly youth. Um, you know, it is something that is happening, and I think it's. I personally think it's a dangerous thing. I'd love to kind of hear what you think about you know canceling somebody who's very much at the start of their career or just even the start of their adult life. Both the danger of someone being canceled and the danger of people operating in the world in fear of being canceled, right? Because you, first of all, you have people who are out there and they might say or do something and now you're being canceled when you're 15, 16, 17 years old. And that that's almost the obvious side of the danger. But who, as they're developing their own expressive, you know, their own selves and so on and so forth and, and going through adolescence and into early 20s at a time when you should be exploring and experimenting and considering different things and learning how limiting it becomes. And I actually talk to my students about this a lot of this, this sense that they have to uh, hide themselves and that's the layers and layers of of finstas and so on and so on. like how do i find space where i can be myself where i can uh not be uh in that risk of being canceled but also participating right they don't want to retreat but they also recognize the dangers of being out and it actually is really anxiety producing for a lot of young people as they're coming up uh, and thinking about that and so we can have a culture where we're saying, okay, people need to be more careful about what they say, but do we really want a culture where everyone has to always be careful about what they're saying? And because, sanitize themselves, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Let's be realistic. We would all have been canceled if there were cameras on us when we were teenagers. Like that, you know, the, this idea that these teenagers need to be canceled immediately. I mean, for saying a, a comment like that, that it's rude, it's, it's, it shows that you don't value your your followers, but to try to dismiss her off, you know, social media for the rest of time seems a little ridiculous. We've seen that a little bit with athletes also, where when you have, uh, it's come up a couple of times where there were um, quarterbacks or, or primarily quarterbacks, but a couple of other players right before the NFL draft, where all of a sudden like a video comes up or, or something is shown from social media from several years before when they're like 15 years old, um, and the night before to almost try to harm the draft status where it's being used as a weapon by other people to try to, you know, to position their own clients or somebody else, whoever's responsible for it. But it is something where I think most people recognize that if something did, like it was one specific one, if you look at a, a quarterback, the quarterback for the Bills, Josh Allen, the night before the um, he was drafted, people put out things, oh, look at these lyrics, look at these, the use of the N-word on his social, on his Twitter from six years before, look at this thing, if, uh, if it ain't white, it ain't right, look at what he's doing. Well, when you looked at it, it was, when he was 15, if it ain't white, it ain't right, it was actually from Phil Dunphy from Modern Family, um, and he had quoted it, and you actually found it, it had been on right before. Uh, the other lyrics were from a, a, a song that actually friends of his had put on. It wasn't him just indiscriminately throwing out, you know, a word like that. Um, and so there was context and it, pe people took the time and, and they understood it. It was also a learning experience, you know, for others to be able to say, hey, look, you know what, I, I gotta be careful all the time. But teenagers are, you know, that's where you're finding yourself. The reason why you can't rent a car till you're 25 years old is because your brain is still evolving until then. That's why rental car companies don't rent you the car before that. And so until that time, People have to figure it out. And it's not, it's not, I, that was a fun fact that I learned it's sort of relevant to this. It's like, you know what, we're all, even I think people are still a work in progress beyond that. But like, there's a point that 
people have to figure out what's right and wrong. And I think there's going to be a lot of uh, rude awakenings for people who uh, are so into or that age and so willing to cancel somebody and then not on the, and, you know, on the flip side of it, I think that there's people that you can learn from and have role models. We uh, have been, you know, we were, we were really grateful to have a chance, um, you know, over the past year, um, Darnella Fraser, who's the, you know, the, now 18 year old girl and, and uh, young woman in, in Minneapolis who took the George Floyd video. And so we've been able to you know, work with her team and have a perspective. Well, there's a case where you have like a role model who, who did something right, but there were even still people trying to hate on her in some way and, and be able to do that. But because of the overwhelming positivity of what she did, it never got really far, but there's still people who want to be like, so like look at any word she would say and, and like look for a problem. And thankfully they haven't found one, but I think even the people who are in the best position of representing teenagers, the finest are still themselves. Someone wants to take somebody down and be the one to do that. And Matt, I wanna, you kind of make me think when you mention these athletes in these scenarios, I think heavily of LeBron James. LeBron James, one of the biggest superstars in the world, one of the most successful basketball players ever. LeBron has been very vocal lately about his thoughts on everything from politics to Black Lives Matter and everything in between. And people have been trying to say, hey, LeBron, stay in your lane. You're a basketball player, you're an athlete, don't comment on that. So I think there's also, um, as Joan was saying, there's an opportunity, people wanna speak their truth and if they're passionate about something, they should have that ability to give their opinion and give their thoughts. Um, but then I think there's also an opportunity, like you mentioned, the young lady who captured the George Floyd video, there's an opportunity to make a positive uh, difference and change the world. She changed the world with that video. Um, and what helped her is you guys are working with her, people are celebrating her, people are giving her support. And so when we talk about this younger group and the way they like to navigate, I think it's a responsibility of those of us who are older, or even I'm a millennial, to say, hey, I've got your back here, or this is not right, or this is like how the Twitter has, you know, um, Dax mentioned the Twitter mob, as people may be attack, attack individuals and be nasty, there's an opportunity for those of influence or those of power to say, hey, I've got your back. Right, but I think a key thing that you talked about is that the things LeBron is speaking about, he's so effective and powerful when he's talking about his experience himself. I think that the key of where sometimes it goes off, and, and this has been something that's just been very frustrating to watch over the last few weeks, is that there are celebrities who are commenting about issues like about Israel, Israelis and Palestinians who have no idea what they're talking about in terms of the complex history of things and are making comments that are like absolutely over the line and anti-Semitic and inappropriate because they don't know the history and they have they no wanted, concept. They, they just want to join the conversation. Yeah, and again, people should be always be free to yeah. speak about whatever it is yeah. they want to talk about and we need to encourage it, but it all goes to that educating yourselves piece because then you know, people can just get so emotional. And when you look at the back and forth that happens on, on Twitter, the same thing, you know, could happen in email, it could happen back and forth. People got to like slow down a little bit and really understand like what they're saying, read it. We're all, we all can pass and emotional about things, but it's going to be a lot more important if you have someone who's a person of color who experiences something with the police. You know what? I'm not, I don't have that same experience. So if I'm going to like listen or read or watch something, that's going to be educational to me because I don't have that same experience. And hearing it from someone directly is, is very powerful and very educational and very important. When you start going into other areas, you can certainly be opinionated and, and we live in a free country, we want people to do that. But it's important that if you're, you don't quite know what you're talking about on those things, at least say, hey, at least qualify your statements. Look, this is what I know from this perspective and do that, and then you can have a dialogue. And there's been some really interesting ones online between people who are very pro-Palestinian and people who are pro-Israel, who have like really ended up in a really good place of educating each other by saying, hey, you know what, listen, everybody wants peace. Everybody cares about the human beings involved. No one wants anybody killed on either side by these things, but like you need to, to figure it out. And I think if you're looking to want to like attack somebody on a position, that's where it's sort of gotten out of hand. And I think the celebration of that is there. But, I, and I think going back to one thing that Jones said at the beginning about, again, about the power issue, is that people especially wanted to empower those who were not empowered before. I want to give them that opportunity. And we need to do that. But, the, the, but seeing that in Hollywood or in politics or in sports, 
is also different than seeing it in Americans in everyday life. The number of women uh, who are single moms or are moms who are, who are single earners in the family who are facing all sorts of harassment and discrimination in, in, and don't have anybody to amplify it, don't have someone to help speak up. That's where the importance is of taking the lessons that are more visible and empowering others and, and you know, being part of programs to support people like that. And that's where to me, like there's a way to make the difference and say, hey, how can we take this situation and fix it for others as opposed to how can we take the situation and bury somebody? And I think people are too much focused on the burying somebody and not enough on how can we use the attention to this to educate people and stop and think, hey, you know what? Maybe you need to treat somebody differently. Yeah, it's all about the amplification of the voices that are authentic, that, you know, have, you know, know, like you said, know the situation, know the context. And, but unfortunately, the nature of social media is, again, whether it's bots or real people, it can be a pile on. I do want to refocus the conversation a little bit on the actual rehabilitation process. And Matthew, you were talking about your client who has done the work, but not really, you know, privately and not really kind of been public about it. Do you feel, and I, I would love to ask each of you, that there has to be this some type of public acknowledgement. Otherwise, you're kind of, you know, allowing the echo chamber to resonate with all the other kind of conversation, but not goes back to what we were saying, the people that were directly affected by it and the people that have done the work. You know, does your does that client or that that individual have to at some point come out and say like I did X Y Z? Um, does that feel performative? Does that feel necessary? I just want to hear your well, thoughts. Well, I think the ideal place is that you have a third party who is bringing it up on their own and speaking about it. It could be someone who's part of the offended group. It could be part of somebody who has spent time seeing the other efforts that the person has made. Um, and, and to me, that's, it's always more effective if you have somebody else say, hey, I spoke to the person and I really saw that because then it's the credibility yeah. of a third party. When you talk about the Nikana thing, I know someone who's a major Jewish leader who has been blown away by Nick Cannon in private. Um, and, and it's something where the person you know, wasn't asked to speak about it, isn't going to, but it's, it's understanding the audience that matters. And I think that in a way is more sincere. And, but the reality is if someone wants to be able to play again, someone wants to be in a show again, wants to be in something, then it's something you have to, the powers that be, and whether it be a team owner, whether it be a league, um, or whether it be uh, you know, a producer or a distributor um, or a studio, they're gonna be the ones who sort of hold the cards. Yes, you can distribute things independently, um, yes, there are the ways to reach audiences, but the fact is that in certain areas you have to do it. But you know what? Some people are perfectly happy that if they finished a part of their lives to be able to move on and for them to know that they improve themselves and they don't need to anybody else to sign off on it. But from a practical perspective, eventually someone's going to need to to address it. But I think if you can be a little more creative and subtle, um, that that serves your purposes better to let others and, and allow your actions speak for themselves. Gabrielle, your thoughts, because you also work in kind of communications and crisis management. Yeah, absolutely. I think it is important. It is wonderful. You always want, from a PR perspective, you always want other people talking about yourself and tooting your horn versus you tooting your horn. If you're an artist, you want someone else saying, this is the best album ever, then you coming out and saying, my album is better than anything. So it is phenomenal when other people recognize you, when other people show receipts. But in the same token, uh, if you are canceled or you do have an incident where people look at you differently, it is very important to be able to come up with receipts. So if I'm giving a position at Team Vogue and people say, no, you don't deserve that position at Team Vogue, you can say, hey, since I was 17 years old or since I was a teenager, I've changed, here's examples, here's receipts. So I think in that instance, there weren't receipts. Um, there wasn't evidence to show that there was growth from what people felt was erroneous issues and tweets that she made when she was a teenager. So from standpoint one, if other people recognize you and other people can back you up, other people can give you the receipts, that is preference. But if not, you need to have some receipts. And Dax, you know, as a producer for a podcast, you've had people come on with the receipts, with the proof that they've done better. Um, you know, as you said, you give them the opportunity to tell their own story, but do you also feel sometimes they need that extra third party nudge as well? Yeah, you know, I would personally, I'd like to hear it from their, their own mouth if I'm talking to them, but if it's a new story, then yeah, I think coming from a third party makes complete sense. I think Matthew hit it 
on the head with the way he said it is like, look, if you want to be in this industry, if you want to keep working, if you want to land new jobs, then yes, people are going to want to see what you've done to better yourself. Um, and, and I think getting that out there, because listen, if you don't say anything and you just stay quiet and disappear in your house, the last headline when your name gets Googled is the horrible thing that you did. So if the next headline beyond that is, this is what I did to change myself. This is the therapy I went to. This is the people I talked to. And this is how much I've changed. Then that's where the narrative shifts. But if you just don't care to work anymore and you don't want to do anything and you don't want to you know, be back there and prove yourself to people, then yeah, you can keep quiet. But I think it's important to show people that um, you've learned from your mistake. And a lot of it's a sequencing of how you do it. Um, and I think that goes back to what I was saying before is that you have people who, when they're called out on something, just some of them just oh have these gushing statements, oh, I'm so emotional and all these things. I'm not trying to make light of someone's response like that, but it, it's a lot more effective if you save your language for after you actually learn something. Um, in, in the cases where you actually did something wrong. Again, there's a separate issue of someone being canceled for something where the issue is in dispute. And I think that's a whole other set of challenging circumstances because you know, we, we had, you know, one person who, um, you know, was canceled temporarily, but they were fortunate enough that there were, um, there were Instagram, um, text, uh, Reddit, all sorts of evidence it's that basically existed. Receipts, yeah. Well, yeah, but it was things that were, I mean, I'm a lawyer uh, by training also. And, 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 you know, it was like amazingly overwhelming objective evidence that the claims made against them were just and the answers person were false and so after investigation the person was you know allowed to continue and do things but there was a damage that was there because it's not the most famous person and so to dax point yeah the last thing people had seen was one headline we did correct it we did help the person is back doing almost everything they were before but there was a, a significant you know harm to them just by the fact that they were accused and i think i, I think that the the danger areas of the is when someone does something wrong and there's an overreaction and not allowing the person to come back. And then the separate is where there's a uh, trying to define someone by something where it isn't even clear what actually happened. Matthew, um, do you ever, do you think there's ever a situation though? Because I appreciate it when someone just head on acknowledges they messed up and they say, I'm going to go figure this out. I, I, I get the, let, let me wait and I'll apologize once yeah. I've learned. But I think there are some situations where I'm like, no, I want to hear you own up to it. And, and I, I appreciate when people own that and just say, you know, I screwed up. I didn't know what I was talking about. I am now going to work towards education. Yeah, totally agree. That's what Myers did with the statement. His original statement was absolutely, he did own it entirely. Um, but he also then said, you know, look, I have learning to do. And then that was it. He gave that statement. He did absolutely accept responsibility. He has done other things where we did like a, a conversation with a group of students at the, uh, the Hillel at the University of Miami. And we, the way we set up the hour conversation was that the first half hour was of Myers telling the kids what he learned and of having, explaining how he was wrong and, and explaining how he even came to say it and, and look into those things. But the other half, was him asking them about what their experiences were of being on the receiving end of anti-Semitic um, slurs or circumstances. So he came away with saying, hey, here's why or how I was ignorant. Here's how this happened. And then the other half of it became, what can I learn from you and what's happening? And so it was such a powerful, meaningful exchange because he was upfront like Dax, I, I totally agree with you. I'm not saying just like avoid it at the beginning, but I think there's limits to how much you can just like you know, own something if you still don't really even understand the background of it. That's, that was my point. I think both are, are, are important. But if you can get that dynamic of acknowledgement and apology and acceptance of responsibility combined with listening to somebody, to me, that's like incredibly effective. And if we could set up more opportunities for that for people, you know, I think we'd all be a lot better off. That's a really good way to kind of wrap up our hour. I can't believe we're at time already. I feel like we can keep going. I want to let Joan kind of have the parting thought here because again, you deal with this space. You talk to your students who are very much engaged in this space. Um, you know, what is the takeaway for them? You know, you talked about how you don't want them to censor themselves, but also be authentic. What, and what advice would you give to any person on social media to kind of live authentically, but, you know, be mindful that these, 
these kind of practices are out there and, and you know, there are these toxic pile on behaviors. I would say what's on my mind about the, the, the topic of cancel culture is that these conversations typically focus on what people should either do to not be canceled or do when they are. And I don't think that we talk enough about the canceling behavior itself. And so we talk about the Twitter mob as if it's not us. <laughs> and we talk, right, but the Twitter mob is us, right? Every retweet, any, can you believe that this happened? And so it may not be us in one circumstance, but it's us in another circumstance. So having that conversation with my students okay, about, okay, how are you communicating? But then also having the conversation about what does it mean to just be a citizen in social? Right. And how do we operate as citizens and social and what is it that people get from spending a day retweeting things and being in community with one another as they are canceling. And I don't think that we think about that. There is some research happening on it and so on and so forth. But I think that there's some work to be done, done there so that we can not only know how to be better at communicating, because that really, we're all now PR people. We're all our own PR people. And so we have to just get better at communications. And my career before I was a professor was 17 years in PR and corporate communication. So I, but I did that pre-social and now coming out and it, the individual has to take that action themselves. But then also, how do we want to treat others, that grace we were talking about? Can we be more gracious humans on the internet, I think is a question we should be asking and talking more about. Yeah, that's a really good ending thought, something that all of us can think of. Um, I wanted to again thank Joan, Gabrielle, Dax, and Matthew for your time and this very robust discussion. It's been an interesting one and uh, you know you can actually uh, join us for an encore of this conversation this Friday on Clubhouse. We'll be inviting you to a discussion uh, June 18th at 4 p.m. Uh, where we will have some of these panelists and talk and elaborate on some of the points that we made here. Thank you again everyone for joining us today for this conversation on cancel culture.